My Lord Inquisitor, further to my remit as chronicler to the Logos Historica Vertia, please find the appended report for your perusal. I should hope that your well-earned rest from your labors is treating you well, and that you shall soon return to your duties with renewed vigor. I will admit to being somewhat surprised upon your request, but as it is so often said, one does not simply turn down a request from the Ordos. May this work be something of a new chapter in the relations between our two orders. Or if not, at the very least, stand competently beside your previous discourses. Your servant, as always, Oculus Imperia. The Siege of Terra was the final and most important major conflict during the civil war known as the Horus Heresy. The forces of chaos that marched upon Terra, led by the traitorous war master Horus Lupercal, were vast and seemingly endless. The war master would have at his disposal elements from the Dark Mechanicum, former Imperial Army regiments, traitor Titan legions, chaos cultists, beastmen, and demonic entities. But, more importantly, Horus's forces included seven of the nine traitor legions. The Sons of Horus, World Eaters, Emperor's Children, Thousand Sons, Death Guard, Night Lords, and Iron Warriors. With the exception of the Night Lords, each of the traitor legions would be led by their respective Primarch. While a small force of word bearers led by Crimson Apostle Zardu Leak would accompany Horus's forces during the siege, the bulk of the 17th Legion, as punishment for Lorgar's attempted coup against Horus, would serve as the traitor's rear guard, in order to delay the approaching Loyalist fleet led by the Ultramarine's Primarch, Rubut Gulliman. The 9th Traitor Legion, the Alpha Legion, would appear to have seemingly abandoned the war altogether by this point, with their forces taking no part in the final conflict. In stark contrast to the vast number of forces under Horus's command, the Loyalists only had three Space Marine Legions that stood in the defense of Terra. The Blood Angels, the Imperial Fists, and the White Scars. While the siege would be hard fought and a bloody conflict, with both sides suffering from heavy casualties, the conflict would ultimately be decided upon the Vengeful Spirit, Horus's flagship. For reasons known only to Horus, the War Master would lower his ship's void shields during the conflict, allowing the Emperor of Mankind the Primarchs Sanguinius and Rogel Dorn, and a small contingent of Loyalist troops from the Legion as Astartes, Legio Custodes, and Imperial Army to teleport aboard the War Master's ship, giving the Loyalists the opportunity to end the conflict by slaying Horus. However, something would go awry during the teleportation process, resulting in the Loyalists being scattered about the ship. When the Emperor finally reached the bridge, he would discover Horus standing over the broken and lifeless body of Sanguinius, who had found the War Master first. The Emperor and the War Master would engage in a final duel to determine the fate of humanity, with the Emperor ultimately proving victorious, despite suffering from a mortal wound during the course of the battle. With the death of Horus, the traitor legions would begin to withdraw. Rogel Dorn would inter the Emperor into the life support systems of the Golden Throne, where the Master of Mankind remains to this very day, existing in a perpetual, agonizing state of undeath. Yet the events of the siege could potentially have played out very differently. Prior to the arrival of Horus's forces, Rogel Dorn, who had been made the new Imperial War Master in all but name, issued a summons for any and all Loyalist forces that were able to return to Terra in order to prepare for the inevitable siege. While it is well known that the White Scars, Blood Angels, and the remainder of the Imperial Fists Legion would all be amongst those who bolstered Terra's defenses, there was a fourth legion that would heed Dorne's call and set course for Terra. The Space Wolves. The Wolves would be the third Space Marine Legion to answer the summons of Dorne, following in the wake of Dorne's own Imperial Fists and Jagatai Khan's White Scars. As the Loyalist Primarchs began their initial strategic meetings to determine the best course of action for dealing with their treasonous brothers, Lee Man Russ, the Primarch of the Space Wolves, would disagree with Dorne's plan to simply wait for Horus to march upon Beta Garmin, a strategically important region within Segmentum Solar that served as a gateway to the Sol system. Instead, 
Russ would propose launching an assault against Horus prior to the traitor's arrival within Beta Garmin, in order to, for lack of a better term, decapitate the serpent. While his brothers debated about the pros and cons of such a mission, Russ would eventually grow incensed at Dorne's stubbornness, before the Wolf King would gather his legion and abandon Terra in order to return to Fenris to prepare for an assault against Horus, much to Dorne's disappointment and anger. Space Wolves would ambush the Sons of Horus Legion within the Trisolian system, as the traitors resupplied in preparation for their assault upon Beta Garmin. Russ, along with many of his warriors, would board the Vengeful Spirit, leading to Russ and Horus engaging one another in battle. The Wolf King would manage to inflict a devastating injury upon Horus, although ultimately proved unable to kill him due to his own hesitation. The majority of the Space Wolves Legion would be destroyed during this desperate assault, and Russ himself would be severely wounded during his duel with the War Master, both forcing the Space Wolves to ultimately withdraw. But what could have happened if Russ had decided not to go through with this impetuous plan to slay Horus? What if Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves instead chose to remain upon Terra in order to bolster the world's defenses? The most obvious difference would be that the number of Loyalist warriors able to take part during the Siege of Terra would have increased substantially. The Space Wolves, while not the largest legion, still boasted an impressive number of warriors, as according to Horus Heresy Book 7, Inferno, the Space Wolves had approximately 100,000 to 130,000 Astartes within their ranks. This, in turn, would make the Siege of Terra a much bloodier and difficult battle for the traitor legions. Not only would the traitors have to contend with a larger number of foes, but they would also be pitted against a legion that, according to some, was designed for the sole purpose of combating and destroying other forces of the Legion as Astartes, one whose Primarch was unofficially deemed the Emperor's Executioner. In turn, this would also grant Imperial forces additional troops that could be used to reinforce Beta Garmin prior to the Siege of Terra itself which could, potentially, delay the traitor forces for a longer period of time, allowing Rogaldorn the time necessary to implement additional structural defenses and militaristic reinforcements to the Imperial Palace, as well as to other strategically important locations upon the world and within the Sol system. During the course of the siege itself, as detailed within the novel The Lost and the Damned, the traitor legions would launch a number of attacks upon civilian populations in an attempt to draw loyalist forces away from the Imperial Palace. While the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists remained behind the walls of the palace to ensure its defense, Jagatai Khan would take two-thirds of his own legion in order to aid the surrounding civilian sectors, against Dorne's wishes. It's possible that Liman Russ would have chosen to do something similar seeking to punish the traitors for enacting such an underhanded tactic. But even if Lehman Russ had only left a third of his legion's warriors in order to aid Jagatai Khan in this particular quest, this would still give the Loyalists more warriors with which to defend the Imperial Palace. Russ's presence would have also had an effect during the assault upon the Vengeful Spirit. If Russ had accompanied the Emperor, Sanguinius and Rogel Dorn aboard Horus's flagship, then Russ could have potentially made his way to Horus before his brothers, which would, in turn, have resulted in the Wolf King being slain by the War Master, instead of, or possibly in addition to, Sanguinius. Alternatively, Russ could have arrived upon the bridge to battle Horus alongside another of his brothers, or possibly the Emperor himself. If such a thing had happened, well, then Horus could very well have been defeated by the Loyalists before striking down Sanguinius or mortally wounding the Emperor, resulting in both the Emperor and Sanguinius surviving the Horus heresy. If Sanguinius survived the battle, thanks to Russ's presence, this would mean that the Blood Angels and their future successor chapters would never have been cursed with the Gene Seed flaw known as the Black Rage, which came about due to the psychic death scream of Sanguinius. If the Emperor had not been mortally wounded, then the Master of Mankind would still be able to walk amongst his people from time to time. Not only would this bolster the morale of the common citizenry of the Imperium, but the Emperor would also be able to clearly voice what he demanded of the High Lords of Terra, not needing them to erroneously misinterpret his will. However, 
Even if the Emperor did not suffer a mortal wound during his confrontation with Horus, it is likely that the Master of Mankind would still have been forced to remain upon the Golden Throne in order to contain its rampant energies, thanks to the damage caused to both it and the Imperial Webway Project by the Thousand Suns Primarch Magnus the Red prior to the onset of the Horus Heresy. Despite this, the Emperor could still have had an opportunity to leave its confines in desperate circumstances for short periods of time, allowing him to potentially take part in such conflicts as the War of the Beast or the events of the Reign of Blood. In addition, depending upon the number of casualties that the Space Wolves would suffer during the Siege of Terra, it is even possible that the modern-day Space Wolves chapter could have become the single largest Space Marine chapter. However, given the introduction of the Codex Astartes following the events of the Horus Heresy, this could instead have resulted in the Space Wolves siring a greater number of successor chapters, as opposed to just that of the Wolf Brothers chapter. However, these potential successor chapters, much like the Wolf Brothers themselves, would inevitably fall to extinction, due to the fact that prior to the introduction of Primaris Marines, the Space Wolves were only able to recruit from their homeworld of Fenris. This is simply due to the fact that Fenrisian physiology is the only one shown to be biologically compatible with the unique components found within the Space Wolf gene seed, the Canis Helix. Any baseline human from a world other than Fenris that is implanted with the Space Wolf's gene seed would either reject it or simply die as a result of it. In addition to these previous hypotheses, it is also worth mentioning that if Lee Russ and his legion had never abandoned Terra, then this would also result in a number of ramifications regarding the traitor legions. For example, Russ would not have battled against Horus in the Trisolian system, which in turn means that the Wolf King would never have been able to inflict the wound that came so close to killing the War Master. While this wound would ultimately be sealed by his legion's Medicaid servitors, it would tear itself open again during the battle at Beta Garmin, and in turn plunge Horus into a comatose state. Esha Annie Mohanna, a Titan Princeps of the Legio Solaria, would witness Horus succumbing to his injuries on Beta Garmin, with the news of which bolstering the morale of Imperial forces after she relayed such information to Sanguinius. In order to save Horus' life, the Warmaster's equerry Malogers the Twisted would conduct a sorcerous ritual to restore the Primarch to health and heal him of his wounds, although this ritual would also result in Malogers' death. If Horus had never suffered this injury, then not only would Loyalist forces not have received this important boost to their morale, but Malogerst would have also lived long enough in order to take part during the Siege of Terra. When Horus lay in his comatose state as a result of the wounds inflicted upon him, Lorgar would grow bold and attempt a coup against the Warmaster in order to ensure that he, as the most faithful servant of the Chaos Gods, would be in command of the Traitor Legions. However, Upon Horus's recovery, thanks to the efforts of Malogerst, the word-bearer's Primarch was punished and effectively demoted by the Warmaster, being sentenced to take command of the Traitor Legion rearguard. As such, if Horus had never been impaled by the spear that Russ wielded, then it seems unlikely that Lorgar would ever have attempted to gain control over the Traitor Legions at this specific point in time, although he may very well have attempted a similar such coup at a later date. As a result, Lorgar may very well have taken part in the siege of the Imperial Palace, as opposed to simply commanding the rearguard, an act that may effectively nullify the additional benefits gained by the defenders of having Lehman Russ within their ranks, as Horus's forces would have also had an additional Primarch of their own upon the battlefield. But even then, another traitor Primarch may have been selected to take part in the rearguard in order to delay the encroaching Loyalist reinforcements from the Ultramarines Legion. Ultimately, there may have been many more potential ramifications should the Space Wolves have remained upon Terra to defend it against the traitor legions. As such, we will never know for certain. What do you think? Leave a comment below, and as ever, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this particular video, please feel free to check out my own channel, Oculus Imperia. I look forward to seeing you there.